Hi guys, thanks for listening to another episode of Chatting with Asians. On this episode, I talked to blogger and writer Amber Inthavong. She's Laotian American and an outdoor enthusiast who grew up in Colorado. She got her MBA and worked in finance, but she still felt like something was missing, so that's when she started her blog, Colorado Caribou. We talk about identity issues as a first generation Asian American and the unglamorous side of blogging. She's got grit and determination, yet she's so authentic, and I think you'll really like hearing this episode as much as I did. So here's my chat with Amber. Welcome to the podcast, Amber. Thank you so much. When we last spoke on the phone, I was really inspired hearing about your life story. Um, And I would love to get started by asking you a question about your job switching. I know you're well known for your blog, Colorado Caribou, and that's really focused on adventuring in Colorado. Mm -hmm. But you also had a lot of experience in finance. So what made you decide to switch over? Yeah. So um, I want to say it was uh, last year. I remember I was like sitting at my desk in the office, just sort of thinking to myself, like, if this was it, you know, there I was this MBA graduate. I did everything my parents expected of me. I went to college and got this like stable career and which is fine. That's what every parent, you know, should want for their grown kids to have. But I, felt like there was just no passion in what I was doing. Um, So I felt very unfulfilled. And it was sort of this pivotal moment in my life at 31 to sort of do some soul searching and dig into what it was that I truly loved. Um, And once I tapped, really tapped into it, I found that um, I was really passionate about creative writing. I've always like love that when I was in school. And I was also really passionate about outdoor adventure. Um, Just because being born and raised in Colorado, I've spent most of my life here, well, all of my life here, and I'm just an outdoor junkie. Um, So I wanted to really combine those two passions and come out with the exciting idea of building a local travel blog. And I know coming from like an Asian American family, like you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a pressure, I think, to follow more traditional career paths. So how did your family feel about you doing something a little bit more creative? Sure. Um, and yeah, I can, I can completely relate to that. Um, you know, I'm a single mom, so my daughter, I shared it with her right away. Um, you know, I said, Kayla, what do you think about this? I have this idea And she was like, so hyped. Um, She was 13 at the time. And she's like, do it, mom. Yes, do it. And she's a creative herself. She wanted to like help build a brand and help take the photos. Um, You know, she had my back immediately. And I think it's because Mm -hmm. she saw the late nights that I come back from the office with like this miserable look on my face, you know? And Mm -hmm. um, as for my parents, I honestly didn't tell them right away. Um, I guess a part of me was afraid to. Um, you know, I knew my mom and dad really well, and I knew, like, I could already hear it that they would be like, why, why would you want to change the stability that you worked so hard for, for something frivolous, like a life passion project, you know? Right. Um, cause in their opinion, like culturally, the way they are is like, just go to work, don't complain, provide for your family. Like their mindset is just very difficult different because, you know, they're like, we're in America, we're lucky to have options and be able to work. So we wouldn't be able to do this in Laos. So just like be grateful and, and do what you need to do. Um, and I think, you know, I just like, I kept it from them cause I wasn't, I was apprehensive about their reaction. And one day mm-hmm. after one of my articles published, I brought the magazine to my parents' house. And, um, they said, oh, well, what is this? And I was like, you know, this is, you know, I wrote this article and this is what it's about. And they're like, oh, wow. Um, that's nice. And they had this sort of like speechless response to it. And, um, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to what they did to immigrate here, um, the bottom line is they really just want their children to have opportunities. 
you know, like at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And they wanted their kids to have as many options as they wanted. And as long as there's like food on the table, there's money in the bank, there's a roof over your head. They really just like, I mean, surprisingly, um, they were, they were proud. They were still proud because they're like, you know, as long as you're handling what you need to handle. Um, so they really surprised me with their response. Yeah. And I think that's really great that you were able to have such a supportive, uh, you know, parents and also like daughter too. And mm-hmm. we, at least for our generation, we're in such a different time than our parents' generation. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And so I think especially with technology, like we have an opportunity to, you know, create other just avenues of security or revenue or whatever it is for ourselves. Right. Um, and it allows more flexibility in terms of what does that mean for a career, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean to be a banker anymore or to be an accountant mm-hmm. or um, anything t- traditional like that. So I think it's wonderful that your parents were really supportive of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, um, I mean, just to add on to that, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, you come from parents who well, in my situation with them immigrating here in the seventies, um, their mindset is all about survival. You know, it's about like mm-hmm. you work, whatever job you have to work, you put food on the table, you just like, make sure your kids eat. And like, it's all about survival. And like my generation, it's, it's different because, you know, I was born here and I'm an American. So my generation is like, well, I want to do what my soul, you know, strives for. I want something that I'm passionate about. I want something that like fulfills me. And if I were to talk to, you know, someone in my parents' generation about that, they would be like, why does that matter? You know, they don't understand the value yeah. in that. So it's just like, you're completely right. It's just a different generation. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of like kind of different generations, I know that you mentioned on your blog that your dad was kind of the one that inspired your outdoor enthusiasm that you have mm-hmm. today. Um, you know, taking you fishing and planning road trips. I, I feel like that's such an American thing. I mean, is that something that he brought that outdoor enthusiasm with him from Laos or was it more so like a new family tradition when um, they first came to America? Sure. Um, I like this question. Um, I, my dad, he is someone who is just smart with his money. Um, Mm. So when they got here, it, it really didn't take them long to realize like we couldn't afford fancy trips like Disneyland or cruises Um, because our mortgage needed to be paid. And like growing up, I watched my mom and dad work two jobs. And when I say two jobs, I mean like two jobs each. Um, They were cleaning, they were doing like custodial, like janitor positions, because really my parents had like an eighth grade education. Um, Mm -hmm. So they were just trying to make ends meet. But one element of being Laotian is our strong family values. So Mm -hmm. if we needed to go out of state, Like my mom really wanted to go to Yellowstone. My dad's like, okay, we're going to, we can't afford to fly there, but we're going to drive. You know, so we take these long road trips and he'd take us camping on the weekends. I have memories of when he like saved up for a small boat and we'd go fishing as a family. Um, I mean, sometimes we'd invite other families and picnic somewhere like scenic in the mountains. And um, my mom would bring like the stinkiest fermented stuff on the picnic, by the way. So, um, you know, but it was who we were. And uh, we just like, we really didn't care as long as we were together. And um, I wouldn't really say that he brought those traditions with him um, from Laos. I think more so that my dad did it out of our circumstances at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, So we made new traditions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really cool that like camping and outdooring like that it sounds like such an American thing and it really is and you guys made it your kind of own Asian American or Laotian American like family tradition and I think that's really I don't know that's very cool right yeah absolutely it's kind of like um I think what's beautiful about it to be honest Angie is like um it shows the adapting you know what I mean? Like how they adapted Mm -hmm. and how they were like, 
you know, we're here and, um, you know, we're a family and we want, um, we're not just here to work, you know, like we want to make sure that we have loving memories and that we do things. Um, so I'm like so grateful for my dad for like recognizing the importance of like making time for family, despite the fact that they, they worked so much, you know? Yeah. Yeah, of course. What was probably like to you, what was the most memorable family vacation? Yeah. So, okay. When we were able to afford to go to Laos, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I have like tons of, um, great information about like what to do in Colorado, but the most memorable for me was when we, when we saved up enough to go to Laos. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think I was like in eighth or ninth grade. Um, so it's like just becoming a teenager and my parents took me with them. It was this four week visit, um, where all we did for four weeks, like was see all of my dad's side of the family, all my mom's side of the family. Hmm. And it was like, you know, here in the States, we just have each other, um, immediate family. Hmm. But when you go over there, it's like, holy moly, like there's like (laughs) so much family over there, you know? And, um, there were people that like, I just, I really didn't know because I hadn't seen them my whole life or had relationships with them. But what impacted me the most about that trip was seeing the village where my mom was from. And, um, she was from a a village called Namta and it was, um, a very poor village. And it's like, where like eight to 10 people were cramming into like small makeshift home. Um, and they washed their clothes in the river. It was just like a very humbling experience that I'll never forget. Um, and my goal really is to um, is to go there again as an adult um, and kind of explore a little bit more. Yeah, I mean that would be such a beautiful trip as an adult, yeah. right? Um, you know, I like, I think I definitely. Oh yeah. Go oh ahead. sorry. Yeah, like you know when you're young, you don't um, you don't really appreciate things the same way. Um, exactly so yeah so I think it's an important trip to take yeah no that was exactly what I was going to say too I think uh I think when so my family is um from Hong Kong at least my parents generation is from Mm -hmm. Hong Kong um my like grandparents generation generations before that were really from Chinese villages at the time and so I would love to be able to do a trip like that to kind of like go back to the homeland sort of trip. Yeah. Right. Um, because like America is my home, but um, you know, it doesn't have the deep rooted cultures as much as China does for myself. So yeah. that would also be like a dream trip for me too. <laughs> yeah. And I really feel like getting back to your roots is just absolutely essential Mm-hmm. I mean, my daughter, she's, yeah. I mean, when we're talking about generation, she's like another generation now. And I'm like, you know, I tell her, hey, just so you know, like we are going to, you know, see where grandma and grandpa are from. I think it's really important for you too. So. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you have the opportunity to be able to do that, you know, it's, it's such a, kind of rewarding experience for anyone personally yeah and it's like it's not an easy trip either I remember it's um Mm -hmm. you're like on the plane for two days oh my god (laughs) because from Colorado it's like okay we you know from here to California and then California to um across the ocean and the scariest thing is um and of course there's time difference but the scariest thing is like you're looking down and you just see water um Oh my yeah, gosh. and I was terrified, you know, and then, um, and this is where it gets crazy. Like we, we landed in Japan, I, I believe it was Japan. And then from Japan to Thailand and then Thailand, we got on an even smaller plane from Thailand to Laos. <laughs> and that was where I was like, I think, um, my life is at risk because <laughs> cause that plane was not, yeah, it's, um, you know, some guy in the community that's like flying the plane for you. <laughs> so Ooh. yeah. Yeah. Definitely an experience. <laughs> like an Indiana Jones experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I I would love to shift the conversation into like um kind of Asian American communities. Mm-hmm. Uh like I feel like when most people think about Asian Americans, they probably think of 
large cities like New York, LA, San Francisco. Uh What was your experience like? Um, You know, was there really like an Asian American community in Colorado? Yeah. um, Well, so now we're getting deep because now it's going to get real. Um, (laughs) So here in Colorado, there's a lower income area that we used to refer to as 72nd um, because it was 72nd Street. Um, And this was where a large majority of Laotians lived. And it was like, um, just imagine like an entire block of apartments and, um, you know, their lower income. And as a community, um, you know, a lot of the Laotians lived there. Everyone knew everyone, whether it was from the refugee camp or they were family members, it was just a place where they stuck together. Um, My parents, while they had a great relationship with the community, they didn't want that for us. Um, So we at first like lived in like a mobile home trailer home for a short time. And then they worked their butt off and moved us to a small house in the suburbs. So growing up, my parents would like bring me to Lao community celebrations and the Laotian kids didn't want to play with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were like, well, I was too white. I was too, yeah, it was, and because we were that snobby family that moved to the the suburbs, you know, and um, they had this idea that we were like too good and we were rich, uh, which actually wasn't the case at all. Um, Mm -hmm. And then also like the other side of things is like when I went to the predominantly Caucasian school, those kids didn't want to play with me either because they thought I was weird. I wore like the same clothes every week. My parents didn't volunteer to be a part of field trips. Um, when friends would come over to my house, my mom was like culturally loud and like mm-hmm. cooked smelly food. You know, it's like um, right. I had big identity issues growing up here. Um, so I guess I had like no sense of belonging. Um, so like now today as an adult, I really channeled that. And each and every person I meet now as a blogger, like I embrace and I make them feel wanted. I want to know their story. Um, I know what it's like to be unwanted. So I've turned that into like now being this like social butterfly. And with me, like I always want people to feel like they belong when they have a conversation with me. Yeah. So um, it wasn't easy. We don't have a very large community um, in Colorado. And um, the Mm -hmm. community we do have is very tight knit and small. Um, So you kind of just... um, it's confusing when you're a child because, um, you know, you're going through this identity and you're like, who am I? Where do I belong? And when you don't really understand social norms, um, that's really, really confusing and, and difficult because at the end of the day, you kind of just conclude like, oh, well, I, I just don't belong. And, um, and that that's really hard as a child. So, yeah, yeah so it wasn't easy. Yeah, and- it, and it definitely, I think that's kind of a story that maybe not a lot of people realize is, you know, as a, an immigrant or even specifically Asian American, uh-huh. right? Like, I think people assume, okay, like maybe as a kid, you might have been teased by other school kids who weren't Asian American. Right. But, you know, even with, with sharing your life story or your situation, I mean, it can also happen just within the community, right? In terms oh of, yeah. of other Asian or Asian American kids, just, just from image, right? The, the wow. look that you guys yeah. were more settled somehow, mm-hmm. even though that wasn't true. Yeah. Um, um, and you're so right. You hit it right on. I think that, um, you know, on the surface, it's like, oh, well, how hard did you really have it? It's like, you look different. Sure. But the thing is like, um, you know, it's, when you were a first generation Asian American, it's like, okay. I mean, for me, it's like, I'm Laos, but I'm also American. So it's like when I did certain things or liked certain things, whether it was like a band or, you know, if I was into boy bands or like certain movies, they would be like, Oh, that's so like white or, Oh, that's so like, um, like Asian, you know? So it's like, okay. So I didn't feel right about no matter what, I did or what I liked, it didn't feel right to me. And, um, cause I was told that it, it wasn't, you know? 
Um, so yeah, you know, um, being first generations, just that, that's, that's the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I've also had that same experience where there have been situations where if I say something or do something or show an interest, it's either, oh, wow, you're, you're so Asian for liking this, or you're so white for, you know, doing that or saying that. Um, and it's like, well, I can't help it. I mean, that's just yeah, me. That's who you are. <laughs> and, um, I don't think it, I mean, I don't think it was until I came into adulthood that I was like, oh my God, I, I'm secure with who I am. And I understand mm-hmm. the why behind that now. And I'm like, you know, it's, um, I, I'm really secure with who I am now, but you don't really gain that until you grow up and you gain some experience, you know? Um, exactly. So with children, I think it's important to, you know, communicate with them um, these types of things. So, yeah, for sure. And I guess with your time now, like being a freelance writer and blogger, I know you've been really involved with um, Asian Avenue Magazine mm-hmm. and connecting mm-hmm. with other communities that aren't necessarily in Colorado. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. I mostly write about outdoor adventure. Um, That's Mm -hmm. my real true love. Um, But as the year went on, after releasing my blog, I wanted to really diversify my portfolio. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write about things beyond outdoors. Um, The goal was to initially was I wanted to give myself more experience. I wanted more exposure and to reconnect my true self and, you know, kind of going back to my soul searching I talked about earlier. Um, And Asian Avenue gave me that opportunity because, you know, they're a Denver based grassroots magazine Um, Mm -hmm. and they were really great. I was able to write about topics like the rebuild of our Lao temple that, um, you know, had a fire. Um, I also, you know, traveled to Utah so that I can um, meet like a very well-known Laotian YouTuber um, and kind Mm -hmm. of expand more in my writing. I, I don't, know if like I have any type of like favorite thing I write about um but I would say that at the end of the day I love hearing everyone's story um everyone has a unique story that inspires the soul whether they realize it or not um so when there are other Asian Americans that I meet that I can relate to it reminds me that I'm not alone in what I feel and how I was raised so um you know, when I, when I talk to, um, the Laotian YouTuber, and even when I talk to you, Angie, you know, it's, um, you know, you guys are working in different industries, you know, whether it's podcasting or entertainment, um, music, YouTube videos, and like, I'm a writer, but there's some common like relation we have with each other. And to me, like, it's, it's actually like empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I will say for sure that I, started this podcast just more so of a passion project and it still is a passion Mm -hmm. project um and it's really been such a humbling inspiring uh, just decision I've ever made so far I've been able to connect obviously you know with with people like you Amber and and other Asian Americans who are whether they're creators or they're creating a new industry for themselves or you know more entrepreneurial I think we need to hear more of those stories, um, you know, because, because that's, it's just different ways of breaking barriers Mm -hmm. and, in unconventional ways, different careers, different industries. And we definitely need to like hear and see more examples of that so that, you know, we can kind of break the model minority myth little by little. Um, even, um, there's, this group called Los Angeles and they're in LA and um, which is mm. not even in Colorado, but they found me on social media and they've like reposted my photos and they've like, I've gotten this like support um, without even asking for it, you know? And I think that what you're doing to me is important because um, vocally you're sharing these stories um, to anyone who wants to listen. And I think that's very powerful um, whether you're writing about well, you know, whether someone's writing about it or they're podcasting about it, I think that um, 
everyone's looking for something like this when everyone who's Asian American might be looking for something like this just to kind of get a sense for like, you know, like, oh, it's, I'm not entirely alone when I'm trying to strive to do something yeah. outside of what's, what's normal. Exactly. And yeah, I, I really love that both of us are having this kinds of conversation, right? Because man, I can't imagine what my day would look like today had I not decided to start the podcast or like, can you imagine like what your day would have been like today had oh, you not decided to I write, would still you know, be, um, in the office wondering, <laughs> wondering if this was it, you know? <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it 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 would be such a different okay. outcome. Yeah. Um, has so has your background, um, helped you to like break barriers within the outdoor community because that's that community is just not something I'm personally familiar sure. with. Um. Okay. So in the outdoor community, you read these magazines, you look at these websites that have like incredibly talented writers. Um, some of these, mm-hmm. in, in my opinion, you know, and some of these writers, they have a degree specifically from writing. Um, mine was in business, uh-huh. but um, they're, I mean, these people are, they're so articulate and they're experienced and they know how to capture and deliver a feeling when they write an article about a ski resort or the X games or mountain climbing. Um, but with me, no one knows who I am um, mm-hmm. in Colorado. So like I, spend my days looking for opportunities to write and um, I'll snoop and I'll say, what is this publication missing? Oh, you know what? They could use an article about snowmobiling or camping. And then I'll find out who their managing editors are. I'll call, I'll email. And if I can even get someone to respond to me, I will pitch, pitch, pitch to that person Mm -hmm. and I throw out my ideas sometimes they don't even like it um so I just write another idea um I just never ever quit and um the thing is uh, that I recognize very early on is they aren't seeking me so I have to seek them Mm -hmm. and once they take that short time to hear the why and why I want to write for them and once they sense my passion for the writing they kind of give the underdog a shot. And um, I'm, I'm just this Asian American female with a dream. It's a real hustle because when I decide to write a story for someone, it's, uh, I don't think people realize like, I research the destination, I fill my gas tank, I commit my time to go there, I take the photos and the notes, I go on the adventure and then I come home and I write my heart out. Um, but that's the thing. That's what passion will do to you. It makes you hungry for it. Um, right now, there are no known like Laotian American outdoor writers in my state of Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just decided I want to be the first one. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not easy because you're making a way, and you're like kind of like affirming like okay like I you don't know who I am, but I'm gonna make a name for myself here yeah yeah it takes a lot of um like strength to do that um because you have to be courageous when you're doing passion projects you have to be courageous and like you're putting yourself entirely out there for all the world to judge and have their opinions and criticize but it's like you have to be true to what your soul wants and whether people are like are going to like it or not um, it's about you and it's about, okay, like I, I want to do this. This is what I'm striving for. And people may hate it. People may love it. I don't know, but I'm just going to make my own lane and I'm going to make my way. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's kind of the whole, you know, premise of, of not just my podcast, but it kind of feels like our generation too, right? If, if your first generation Asian American is, is really figuring out what, is the trail that you need to, you know, create for yourself. Yeah. Right. Um, and to recognize that it's not going to be easy, maybe on Instagram mm-hmm. or Facebook or social media, it may look glamorous, it may look fun, but and there's a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Right. And it's not just long hours, but it's also 
a lot of rejection too, right? Or a lot of criticism oh, or yeah. judgment. Uh, um, people yeah. see those like, you know, just like what you said, the glamorous side of it. And um, they don't see the hustle behind it or the effort. I mean, the end result is there and it's very polished and it's very, you know, beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but the the work that goes into it um, isn't isn't ever displayed because no one wants to see the work um, that it takes. But, um, but again, like, I think um, what I really wanted to, to reiterate is, is just that that's what passion does to you. It just makes you really hungry. Yeah. And I'm also saying this, like, recording this in my closet so it's definitely not yes, glamorous yes, yeah they can you know you see the end result but you don't see what's really behind behind the scenes so like, yeah whatever. yeah I mean I'm literally just like crouching <laughs> over like underneath my dresses now <laughs> oh my gosh um are there you know, again, like I'm not really too familiar sure. with the outdoor community or blogging community, but are there other Asian American like outdoor bloggers? Um, and if so, like, do you have a favorite one? Um, I mean, I have had great support from like bloggers in different states, like nationwide. Um, when I join mm. um, groups like uh, the Travel Bloggers Club and things like that, but um. A lot of these bloggers, you know, they have a different niche. So um, it'll be like fashion bloggers or luxury bloggers. You know, they get they get paid to stay at these like really nice resorts. And I am very like, mm. oh, let me show you where to go on a budget. Um, let me show you where yeah. to take your kids. Let me show you um, where to have like a couple's getaway. Um, it, uh, I mean, my background is like, I just, I... I didn't even know how to build a website and I locked myself in my room for like, you know, like three months and just kind of like self-taught myself with YouTube videos on how to code. Oh um, but when I look at these other bloggers uh, and, and th there are Asian American ones that are very successful. Um, I think my inspiration comes more so from Asian American women who are entrepreneurs Um Mm -hmm. So not specifically in blogging, but, um, you know, I follow very closely um, Kulop Vilasak, who is um, Laotian American, and she's a woman who made a way for herself in the film and entertainment industry, which is um, nothing really like blogging at all. Um, but she played a role on an episode of The Office, um, mm -hmm. and she also did her own independent film about um, her self-discovery and her search for her father in Laos. Um, so she understands the importance of community and supporting one another. Um, she is a essential member of Los Angeles that I mentioned earlier. And they are all about, yeah. you know, like finding people who are Asian American and they're trying to like, um, build an identity in the media world and they're all about like building them up and um, providing that support and um, I look up to her very greatly I hope I I this is interesting Angie I said to my daughter last year I said she's the one who showed me a video of the Laotian YouTuber um, who was a comedian mm -hmm. and I said I said Kayla that guy I want to meet him. And she said, mom, you're, she's like, mom, you're crazy. How are you going to meet um, BGZ? His, you know, he goes by BGZ. And, I, and she's like, how can you meet him? He has like tons of followers. Like, how would you even meet him? And he's from Canada. And um, sure enough, I found out that he was going to Utah and I messaged him and I said, I don't even know if you're going to read this message, but I'm going to fly out and I would love to, you know, like come to the meet and greet. And he actually messaged me back and he said, yeah, come through. And oh. so it's everything that you like, you put out there and you're like, whatever you want and whoever it is that you want to manifest into your life, um, you can make it happen. And like, my goal really is to, is to meet Kulop as a, as a female entrepreneur. I think that would, that would be, um, a great thing to add to my bucket list. So I think I'm going to declare that today and, and hope that I can meet her within the next year. Yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> and um, the last question that I had was, you know, as an outdoor mm -hmm. enthusiast, 
what is your next great outdoor adventure looking like? Sure. So um, like recently I've been focusing on projects for my blog and my brand. Uh, I, fin- I just finished a promo video for my website. Uh, so that's going to be coming out soon. And it was my first time working with like a professional camera crew. Um, then there was this podcast that I was just like absolutely so excited about. Um, mainly because like this is like the beginning part of it. And I love that that I can um, be a contributor to it. Um, but we do have a winter series that we're going to focus on now. So we are planning on video footage of snowmobiling in Breckenridge. And there is a new 450 foot snow tubing hill um, in Monarch Mountain that we'll be capturing video of as well. Um, we're just going to connect our mm-hmm. little GoPro Hero 7 on our vest. And then we're going to ride down the hill so that you can get like that kind of real feel of like what it's like to ride down that mountain. Um, and I recently added ice fishing as well. So I'm going to be observing and, and, and doing a post on that. So that's what to expect next. Oh, well, they all sound really exciting. I mean, those are definitely trips that I've never yeah. taken before. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting. I'm excited for it. So we try to like every season before the season approaches, we try to think about, and when I say we, I mean like my daughter and I will be in my room <laughs> with like a whiteboard and we'll say, okay, so like fall's coming up, but we have to focus on yellow, red, orange. Um, we have to focus on foliage of the leaves. Um, and then we'll think of a plan and we'll say, these are the towns that we're going to hit. These are the activities we're going to do. And then like um, throughout that season, we'll kind of like cross it off our checklist. Like, did we hit that? Did we hit that? Mm -hmm. And then like, once that's done, we create like, okay, so now it's the winter series. And um, so we're very organized. Um, I love that I have her as my partner and that we can just like do this together. Um, But yeah, you know, it's just, it's just a way that we kind of keep ourselves uh, accountable for our goals. And um, it doesn't feel like work, you know, it feels like we love it. It feels like, something we want to do so yeah I think that's amazing that you get to work with your daughter too and like you said it's not doesn't feel like work yeah. right but absolutely yeah <laughs> well I thank you so oh much God. for being on my podcast and you know sharing yes, your stories I'm, with us like again I'm excited to be a part of the beginning um episodes of of chatting with Asians I I have this feeling that um there's just going to be this like outpour of support and um I look forward to to where the podcast is going to go. Oh, I mean, thank you so much for your support. Um, it, it means so much yeah, to me, absolutely. really. <laughs> thank you so much, Angie.